Welcome everybody. And Nicole, um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to start us off or do you want me to start us off gathering all the questions? I'll start us off. So we imagine you're here because you have some one or more specific questions after being immersed in the RFP process for a bit now. Um, so we, we'd like to ask you to submit your question in the chat and we'll take a quick look at them and see if there are any commonalities that we can clump them together and address them in some sequence. Don't be shy, Every, there are no stupid questions. Um, everyone's been trying to figure out different dimensions of whether you're, you're looking at a small, medium, large, or targeted impact proposal. Maybe let us know which one you're, you're doing as well so that we can group them that way. But we'll do our best to see, we, we, our goal is to get through as many of your questions in the next hour as we possibly can. And um, the best way for us to do that with, with this many of you joining, which is great to see, is to see if there's some commonalities in your questions. Um, so let's see what you're wondering about. And again, nothing's too large or too small to tackle. We'll do our best. We may not be able to answer everything. Um, and then there might be some questions that we may have to refer you to the um, HSD email address for the things that are just about the actual process or the RFP itself. Um, we're here to talk about just some of the content and the, the framing of questions and responses. And I'm going to mute myself. We'll give it just another minute or so to give everyone a chance to type in their questions before we start grouping and answering. Okay, I'm seeing a few already. Um, let me tackle what I consider to be the easiest one first. <laughs> so, um, Chris, you asked about citations for sources of data. So, I would my general advice to everyone is think like a reviewer. So, if there's something where you can easily um, explain the source of the data you know, according to the US Census, according to a local report that was done, blah, 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 year. Um, just, just enough to let somebody know it exists. If they really wanted to dig it up, they could. They could find their way to it. It's credible to you and you trust it for whatever reason that you've stated. But I don't think you need to do a full bibliography type, you know, author, year, journal issue, volume, page number kind of citation at all. Um, but just, just enough to let somebody know that this isn't just your impression or you're not just pulling this out of thin air. It actually is documented somewhere to you in some way that you find credible. And that's going to be different for everybody. Some people are going to have some peer-reviewed literature on whatever they're looking at, and some people are not, and that's fine. But just be clear about where you are drawing your information from and why you think it's credible and important to act upon. And that should do it. There's no, there's no particular format or threshold. It's just, uh, just explaining where it came from. Chris, go ahead. Well, just to follow up, anything that we get off the data share site, 
do we need to say that as well, you know, according to the data share site or according to whatever, you know, the source on data share, how should we deal with that? So, so data share, um, that's a great question. Data share compiles a lot of sources and they are vetted in order to get onto data share. But if you have room to say, according to the American Community Survey as listed on data share or according to um, you know, uh, Department of Justice data or what, whatever it may be, just because there are hundreds of different sources on data share and the, the reviewers will be getting a basic orientation to all of these pieces of the application, but they may or may not be familiar with all the corners of data share. And so um, I, I, would, I personally would go one step beyond just data share itself, if you have room to do that. Okay, let's see. Um, Nicole, are you? I see some questions related to output measures. Um, there are a couple about how in, to decide between the tiers. Yeah. Um, that, that might be a relatively easy one to address mm -hmm. also. Um, you know, really the the decision about which tier to apply under is completely up to your agency. Um, you know, if you're, um, you know, cause it's just, it's not the, the amount that you request, like that's completely up to you. You don't have to base it off of the oh, last time we got this or last time we asked for this. So this, you know, it's, it's really, you know, based on what you're proposing, what you're um, saying that you'll do with the funding, like how much funding, would that take? And then does that fall within your the small, medium, or large, or target impact tiers? Um, you know, the, I think I saw somewhere in there, you know, an agency that you don't have the capacity to submit applications for both, especially if it's the same project. And so that's really wise because the RFP itself says that you uh, can't submit applications for the same project in multiple tiers. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to grow a program and, you know, and, uh, and the amount that you feel needs to be requested is larger than what you may have received in the past, that's totally okay. And then it becomes a matter of, you know, in your narrative responses, in your budget, does that all really kind of line up where it's, it's clear to the reviewer, here's what they're proposing to do, measure these kinds of outcomes, it costs this much. Um, cause the reviewers also are not specifically be going to, going to be given information like, oh, last time they got this amount and then factor that into your scoring. They're not going to be asked to do that kind of comparison. So it really is on the merits of what you put in your proposal. Does that help? And then, um, Stacy, you had a question about um, basing the impact of small, medium, or large on one year or three years. Did you mean on this, on, is this a size question? Um, so like last year, we were awarded um, three years of the grant. And so um, I'm, I'm looking at, do I base this on one year or do I base it on three years? So when you get into the application, you'll see that the questions about the outcomes ask you for that first year, okay. and the amount is the same, whatever the amount is, whatever the tier is, is the same for all three years. Okay. So um, it's on one year, essentially. Yes, but there is, depending on the, the tier, there's also um, a question that invites you to discuss the outcomes in the subsequent years after the first year, that's a narrative after you list them. Okay, I, so, I guess I was just wondering how to choose between the first small, medium or large. Um, the amount per, per year. Per year, okay. Years is that number. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. And then there's um, 
A couple questions about um, Inbal, I think both of these were yours, the output measures and the uh, how to include capacity building outcome measures. So going from the, the capacity building first, so the capacity building, um, the closer that you can tie that to direct services, the better. These are, this is funding to support direct services. And so if there's um, training that's required in order to deliver services in a better or different way, that might be something to track as a measure of capacity. And then outputs. Um, Can know, I ask people, a question about it, Nicole? Yeah, of because, course. Yeah, just for more clarity, because it is specifically around uh, staff training and I saw in the RFP that there is some example around that, like how to, so it's more, yeah, and it's, we have clear outcomes when it's come to services. Um, I, I guess the question is how much, let's say to, what would be in our outcome measure, you know, to, we would like to necessarily measure how our staff, let's say build capacity over time, which mm -hmm. then of course translate into the impact on the person served and we'll be very specific in how we'll measure that. So like have two sides. I didn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't just from the different um, uh, comments and communication we got, it, and I'm hearing it from you right now. Yes, definitely the services are, this is where the emphasis is. Mm -hmm. However, I would want, yeah, like how much do we want to also look at capacity building because it's mm -hmm. so essential in order to get to changes mm -hmm. in, yeah. So. Yeah. So I, and I think the way you've just phrased that, you're making the case for you need that type of capacity in order to deliver the services a certain yeah. way or a certain mm -hmm. way and to have a certain impact. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's how, how you could describe it. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Just to get this clarity around that. Sure. And then in terms of outputs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little more about what you mean, or perhaps an example? Yeah, I mean, like, um, you know, the, um, if, you know, if I, let me kind of bring up, kind of just for myself, like our, um, in our logic model that we created to be kind of really clear where we are going with that. Yeah. So thank you for the tools, by the way. Um, yeah, you know, in terms of, you know, how many, um, let's say like how many staff will be involved, how many clients, you know, these are the outputs. So, yeah. cause there's no room in the, in the way that the application is set up to actually put a logic model in. I mean, yeah. Right. And so it's everything has to be narrative. Are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some people are very thankful for that. <laughs> some are not. <laughs> so um, just, you know, for those of you who are, are wondering, we, we did do a training on the logic models and we use them a lot. And, and our hope was that even if you didn't use every piece of it, that it would help you um, land on and describe the, the impacts and, and short-term and intermediate outcomes that lead to those impacts. So even if you're not necessarily listing all the outputs in the structure of your objectives, but you might have, um, for example, a, sorry, you may have a, um, a point in the narrative where you can talk about that as a stepping stone towards the, the way that you measure your objectives. I'm not sure how, you, how, how narrowly you've tied the objectives to some of those outputs, but there, there are some gray areas where that could be the way that you measured your progress. And some of it might show up in the, um, in the narrative as opposed into the listing of those objectives and metrics. But Nicole, do you have anything to add there on that? Distance? Yeah, I was just gonna say that same thing. And I think that was yeah. part of Inbell's question too. Like, yeah, I think the, that section, what are the services where they're asking you to describe the program or project, including the activities, like I would interpret that broadly so that if you're saying, you know, we'll do provide X number of, <laughs> services to X number of clients that, um, you know, again, if you can easily fit that in with your character limits, that, that gives the reviewer a good sense of, you know, what you're doing, how much of it, and then when they read the outcomes, 
you know, you've laid a really good case for how what you're doing will hopefully lead to those results. Can Thank I ask you. a clarifying question? Sorry, I'm wrong. Is that okay? Cool. Um, so I just want to clarify what you're saying is like our outputs can be in one of two sections. The objective section would be a good place to put them maybe or that narrative section is what you're talking about. I would say uh, some of it might depend on which tier you're applying for. Like the, if it's a small tier, small grant tier, small tier grant, <laughs> um, the expectations about like outcomes is actually a little lighter that it's, mm. you know, like achievements or it's, you know, and it could be more of like an output type of achievement. As you go higher up in the tiers, there is more of an expectation that the outcomes section, that they are actually phrased more like outcome metrics, you know, in terms of the, what's changed, what's better, what's different for, you know, whoever it is that you're serving. Um, so again, so then in terms of the outcomes, I would say just depends on which tier you're applying for. But I think in all of them, they ask the same question in the what are the services section about describe your program or project. And I think even with the same character limit, uh, no matter how big or small. And so that, that would definitely be a good place to weave that in. Okay, I have one more question about outcomes, if that's okay, related. Yes, please, go ahead. <clears throat> so in the previous grant cycle, there were like, two kinds of outcomes that were asked for, like the quality of service measure and then the outcome measure, or how well do we implement and then are people better off? Are we just focusing on are people better off for the outcomes that the application is listing or do you want us to weave both of those into our outcomes? It, um, so <laughs> like just because of our role with the county, like we're, you know, cause we didn't, yeah. um, like we're not responsible for the RFP. <laughs> um, and so we also don't want to like try to interpret it and then interpret it wrongly or incorrectly. Um, like if you don't see something in the RFP that says include quality outcomes as well as your typical outcomes, then it's up to you. Like, and so it'd be also, again, kind of a judgment call about, okay, are the quality measures, the quality outcomes, like, is that meaningful in terms of being able to demonstrate um, that it's contributing to some kind of impact or that, um, you know, maybe client satisfaction or something along those lines might also be um, just as important as kind of a behavior or status or knowledge type of outcome. And so that's, I would say like, that's where the choice about how many outcomes you include, you know, again, depending on the tier that you're doing could be a, a useful way. Again, if that's a meaningful outcome for what you're proposing. And if I could just add, Madeira, I think you know, this is advice I've given to everybody in individual TA sessions as well. Sometimes when we are working on a proposal and we get into the, the actual questions that we're going to answer and that are going to be put into review, or we lose sight of the you know, stepping back for the overall thing. So going back to that whole table, um, it's 4.1 in the, in the original RFP, the, the big document, that's a table that um, summarizes the points for each section, the why do it, what should be done, et cetera. And it shows the um, what's what they're looking for in each category, in each tier rather, and each category. And it's just really good after you've been in the weeds a bit trying to answer the questions to go back to that. Because the first time we read it, we, it doesn't always resonate about, oh, that's what they're looking for. Oh, that's how I should talk about this. Or that's the buzzword to use for this. So I would highly recommend that as a touchstone at a couple different points in your grant writing at the beginning, the middle, and the end, just to make sure that after you've been um, spending some time and all of you have thinking about 
exactly how you're going to portray the need, your response to it, the outcomes, and exactly this type of question, what, what should our outcomes address? Make sure that what you're saying is aligned with the tier and the descriptions in that table. Because it, it'll read differently to you now than it did when you first saw it, I'm guessing. Perfect, thank you so much. And it's short. <laughs> Um, Madeira, you also had a question about some of the demographics data, and I'm guessing this is a question a lot of people have as well. So you have income information for the Medi-Cal eligible clients, but not for everyone you serve. So I, um, I'm not sure, I, I would think that you would want to describe as best you can the population you intend to serve. If you don't have the data for everyone, but you have a good sense of, okay, the Medi-Cal eligible clients are at this proportion of federal poverty level by definition, for example, because they qualify for that program. But most of the people you serve are not far above that. I think you could justify some, some assumptions about but I, I would not describe only the people you have data for. I would describe your best information, your most informed information, including the ones you have data for from eligibility and the ones that you have anecdotal data for that describe the entire population you're serving, because that's what you're seeking funding for, right? Not just the Medi-Cal eligibles, but a broader population. And again, that might have to show up in the narrative of the need. As Great, that's really helpful. Drop down. Thank you. Nicole, do you have anything? Do you have a different take on that or anything to add? No, I was just about to say something similar. I think there's a, and again, it might vary depending on the tier, but I think there's a question, a narrative question where you can describe population you're serving. And if there's, you know, really wide differences between the demographics you have and who you're actually serving and you're worried about <laughs> is that going to make sense i mean you can use your narrative to help you know explain some of that and again think like a reviewer you know the you want the reviewer to understand who you're serving why you're serving them why you're choosing to serve them in that way um, if you have an opportunity to have someone who's not part of your program um, who could read this for you, that's a really helpful test for whether all of this is making sense to someone. And Claudia, I see you asked a question about you've applied before and received grants, but lately you've been changing your projects and some software that you've used before, and could that be a problem? Can you say more about what what you're thinking um, about with that question. Yeah, thank you. I think I understood because you explained uh, that before that the reviewers will be focused on why we're presenting now. So it's kind of concerned if they will have access to like previous applications and they will compare and if they, it makes any difference. So yeah, you already answered. So we have to be more focused, right? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, th this is not, um, anything where they will have access to information about your, your past applications. Um, Great, good to know. And so, so that's, that means you don't have to explain those kinds of things that are different, but it also means that everything you tell them is all they may know about you. So, so don't yeah. assume that they know things about what you're doing. Great. Thank I know that's you. hard in that. space constraints. I know it's really hard, but um, but just, you know, treat, treat this as a, a fresh start on what you're describing and who is reading it. Don't make any assumptions about what people already know. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. You're welcome. And this would actually be a good time to check. Have all of you seen the last version of the questions and response document that the county posted on the on the HSC's website, put the link in there, um, because there was 
and it was also mentioned in the addendum, but I think um, not everyone had seen it. That those uh, that question where you uh, list all your outcomes, that it used to have a much higher character count. <laughs> And I think some people may have already started like drafting their 3,000 word <laughs> responses for each outcome and that's now been shortened quite a bit. Um, and so I'm gonna just post the link to the HSC's website in the chat again. Um, there's gonna be, as part of this extension to the deadline, there's going to be one more opportunity to submit questions to the county email address, the core funding at santacruzcounty.us. And then if you, um, if you scroll down on that website, uh, you'll see the questions and response section. And the last date that you can submit questions is Monday, February 14th. And then the next posting of the responses will be on February 17th. Coming right up. And there's a there's a link to a PDF on the site where you can then see everything that they've, that's been asked and answered previously. Inbal, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just had one more question, but I don't want to, I just want to oh, be no, respectful of them. I, yeah. I think we've covered the ones that were submitted yeah. in the chat. Let and that has, yeah. Is. So if it's okay, um, and it's more, I don't know, not philosophical or not, I'm just really curious to, to get your insight on that. One of the, uh, insights that we continue to have through the work on this RFP is how much we are lacking equity data. Yeah. And, you know, internally in our organization, and as we look at the, uh, you know, the data that on the data share and all others, we are lacking some significant, especially when it's come, I would, you know, direct input from you know, groups that we just haven't asked. We are, there's, some, there's a whole bunch of questions we haven't asked before. Mm -hmm. And it, um, so let's see if I can ask my question in a way that is coherent around that. So as we, you know, so we are identifying, you know, the condition and how we, and, and we have, you know, we have some data to ground it in and there is some missing data. So there are some assumption or, or we are relying on um, some quantitative, you know, um, in, you know, data that is, you know, more anecdotal in nature, especially at this phase, just because we've been missing it. And I wonder if you have some suggestions on how to name it clearly, because, for, you know, for like the perspective is that we are, this is an equity issue. The fact that we don't have that and how we move forward. Let me pause here, I don't know if I'm making sense. Any Maybe insight around that will be super helpful. I think this is something that almost every organization is gonna grapple with one way or another. Mm -hmm. And we grapple with it in core, we grapple with it in data share. Um, I, I think it, first of all, um, anecdotal information is fine. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, you know, you'll see references to stories yeah. mm -hmm. in yeah. there. Um, so that's that, if that's the source of identifying your need, just, just say so. Um, identifying a gap that you may want to pursue is also something you may want to consider. If something um, is, you know, when we had that continuum of results and evidence, the core continuum of results and evidence that some of you may have been looking at about where to place your program on that continuum, there, that document has some suggestions about ways that you might want to find out more about whether your program is working the way you intended it to and how and what's, um, what is behind its effectiveness or lack thereof. And there are different types of data pursuits that you could entertain, um, interviews, focus groups, surveys, um, and others. So if there's something that you feel is missing from your understanding of your program, how it works, how it could work better, and that's something that you'd like to incorporate into your approach, um, just say so and explain why and how 
Um, and that, that's the way these kinds of gaps get filled. So maybe that's not something you do through this project either, but it, you know, it might be something that we could all revisit um, later is where, where people have identified some common data gaps. And uh, I think it's something that, that we're all gonna have to chip away at one way or the other, because you know, the, the fact is that that is an equity issue that so much of that is just plain missing and, and recognizing that it, things have not been asked in different ways of different groups is, is uh, a first step towards fixing that. But it's not in and of itself, it's not a deficiency in your proposal is what I'm trying to say. If I can just add to that before we uh, take your question, Claudia, or actually Claudia, did you wanna add anything to that? To Nicole's answer? I, wanted, I just wanted to say that it's a scary, I think the part that, um, I don't know, like when we explain that, that we've been lacking something and now we want to, to be part of the project, I'm scared to the language to use because I don't want it to be like, oh, now this is going to be the main weakness of our project. I mean, uh, in that situation, like, because I was thinking like, oh, that's an issue that we all also have, but I was, I didn't know how to explain it in an application. Is it important to explain it to it? Or, I mean, I guess we cannot just erase it from, because it's part of like our history, right? So I don't know, I'm kind of concerned of the language to, to make it right. I think there was, there, I was going to add a few other uh, suggestions or ideas um, to what Nicole said too. Like, I, I know I found it helpful when I go back and reread the application and the RP, like um, to, to then take a step back and like, okay, how, like what kind of story or case are you trying to make across the questions, right? Because then there are different opportunities in different questions to like <laughs> kind of say a piece at a time, right? So part of the, your response about the problem or the need in the community, right? You, you, you describe, you cite whatever data you have. Part of the problem could be that the data isn't available, you know, um, by different equity dimensions or it's not disaggregated. And sometimes that's, a, that's, a, that's because of just how the data was collected or maybe the sample size was too small that then there are concerns that if, data is broken out by ethnicity, that it could actually allow someone else to identify. Like there's all these reasons why data may not be available um, disaggregated in the way that we would like it to. You don't have to explain all those reasons, but just say that is part of, you know, part of the, part of what contributes to the problem, right? The, the absence of that equity data anecdotally, or when we talk with our partners, when we talk with, clients, we hear that you know, that's where you can weave in the qualitative data to, to supplement or, or help fill in some of the quantitative data gaps. Um, in the narrative question about, uh, I'm trying to remember which section it's in. I think it's the, I think it's still in the, what are you going to do? And you're describing, um, what information tells you the proposed program or project will meet the intended outcomes and influence the inequities stated. If you have other <laughs> data, whether it's you know numbers or, or qualitative that you think could help, again, kind of bolster the case that, okay, this, this will help and this will uh, help provide some of that missing data. I think that's a, a really good suggestion that Nicole had. And then I think there's another and again, the question might vary slightly depending on what tier, but when it asks, I'm looking at the large grant application, how will staff collect information about the program or project, including progress and outcomes? That's another place where you could say like, okay, we haven't done this previously and we're realizing, I mean, you wouldn't say it in these exact words, but <laughs> like it could actually be um, a strength to say that part of applying an equity lens is the realization that that kind of demographic data or this kind of question needs to be part of your evaluation tool. And so here's how you're going to incorporate that now uh, into your evaluation process. So that could potentially be a place. Um, and then that question about organizational capacity, 
and again, the expectation about how how detailed you get um, increases, you know, depending on the size tier that you're applying for. Um, but if that's also an insight that's come up through this process, like, oh, we haven't we haven't done that look internally, we haven't been collecting that data that a lot, but that there are ways that you can frame that. I think in your response to say. Uh, we haven't yet, or we don't have access to that kind of information, but this is our plan going forward. That's part of what the question asks. And so, um, it, you know, it's not necessarily something where like reviewers are going to be instructed, oh, give them fewer points if they say they haven't, <laughs> you know, developed an equity plan yet, or they don't collect that data on their staff. Like there, there isn't anything specific like that where you, it works against you to say that you haven't done some of those pieces yet. It's more about like prompting for, for your thinking and your plans about how will you as an organization beyond just delivering the services uh, operationalize equity. And Stacy, I, I see your question about still finding it challenging to identify the service category. Is it better to use other? Like, does it work against you in a sense if you use the other category? I know sometimes that can be um, not appealing because they want us to fit into one of the categories that they have. But our project really has to do with criminogenic um, issues in um, addressing the cycle um, that that happens and. Um, really just, um, yeah, addressing that cycle in, in, uh, for the people that we're serving. So I don't know which one to put that in. I'm like, I still don't, I've, I've done some reading. I still don't know which one. I, I'm assuming it goes under health. Um, um, you know, there is SUDS in there, but I don't see criminogenic issues or um, addressing criminology. Um, There's, um, there's a public safety category under community and human services. And is, is it, a, what, can you say more about what, what the program does? Is it counseling? Is it yeah, no, it's um, it's a program for women um, who have prior engagement in the criminal justice system, and um, it's really uh, they come into our program, they stay in our program. It's a transitional housing program called Gemma. You might have heard of them, and um, so yeah, a lot of what we're addressing is just the those cycles and um, issues that you know, tends to lead them back around again to re-engage with the criminal justice system. Um, they do, they norm normally do have a SUDS diagnosis, often mental health. Um, there's a lot lumped into it, but really it's about um, um, addressing those patterns in life that, um, that have led them to where they or engaged with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of choices, I think. I know, that's where I'm like, where do I go with this? So there's a lot of ways to go. Yeah. And what, can you say again, what is your program doing to help them address yeah. those patterns? Yeah, so Gemma is a transitional housing program that was started, um, I, I have it written down in my proposal, I can't remember what year. Um, but New Life took over the contract. Um, the county um, allowed us to take over that program in 2018. It's a transitional housing program for women who have prior engagement or at risk of um, future engagement with the criminal justice system. So we go into the jails, we do groups, we identify women who would be ready for our transitional housing program. We do intensive case management. Um, we do you know, therapeutic interventions. We help them with um, getting, get employment, get documents. 
um, everything. They'll go to parenting classes. Um, you kind, kind of just everything that it takes to sort of restart life. Um, and they live with us uh, for up to 18 months. And it's a small group of women, six women. And um, yeah, it's just a very intensive program um, where every minute of the day is structured and accounted for. And um, we actually are having really good success with the program. So, you know, thank God. Yeah, the women have, have done well in the program. That's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah. Stacey, both times that you've described that to us, you've said transitional housing in the first three words. Um, so that might be something. And, and then um, the kinds of things that you've described are indeed varied um, and kind of wrap yeah. around. There is a, there's a mentoring and life skills option under community and human services. Um, so I, in answer to your question about will it be detrimental or not to, to your score, I, I think I would not choose other just because I think you have these options. Okay. Um, I don't think it would be detrimental to, I, I don't think it would be scoring, but I, I think the more specific you can be. And the other thing is, um, I think some of those service categories probably end up um, routing proposals to different reviewers. Okay. And so, um, you might want to just think about who who would who would you want reviewing your proposal? I, I'm not saying that will happen, but just that be, that would be another way to choose among because you could make a case for so many of these as you as you just described, and I don't think you can go wrong. But if you wanted to tilt one way or the other, you might want to think about that. Um, so you're thinking that community and human services would probably be the more yeah. No, I, I'm not thinking it's more or anything. I'm just pointing out that you, the way okay. that you described it, um, yeah. use the words transitional housing out of the gate in the description a couple times, and then you describe a lot of other services. And I think you could make a really strong case for any number of these. Um, but those are two that struck me listening to you. So, okay. Stacy, have you already developed your outcomes and, and answered the question about what services are you providing? Like, have you already done those pieces? I'm not super far down the road. Um, my predecessor wrote the last grant for this. So I just found out two weeks ago that, um, and cause I never got an email saying, hey, this is on the table. So I'm just playing catch up right now. I'm not that far down the road. Um, I, I, we have been collecting data um, and we do have numbers to reflect what we've done and how many graduates and, and um, you know, the success. And we do sort of um, uh, surveys every month that the women then answer as far as how they're doing. Um, so I've got that kind of raw data that I can then put into that. But no, I'm not that far down the road. Yeah, and that's okay. I, I was, uh, I've suggested to a few people in, in my one-on-ones, um, like you might want to save those questions about select the core con primary core condition and choose your service cut until after you've written more of your proposal because, um, you know, after you've written your proposal or, or gotten farther along, come up with your outcomes, that might actually give you those insights about, oh, I seem to be describing this <laughs> more than this. Right. And then good. based on that, mm -hmm kind of deciding which service category, which core condition do those seem to be most aligned with, um, knowing that there can be multiple service categories, multiple core conditions that are applicable, but because they ask you to choose, you know, just one. And that's another area where the narrative is going to do some heavy lifting for you, as opposed to that one drop down menu. Right. right. Okay. And then Stacy, do you know that you can also sign up for a one-on-one -on -one PA session? I think I on. had um, signed up for something later today, but um, again, I'm <laughs> just really coming into this really new, <laughs> yeah. The, the one you signed up for later today is about how to use the online application platform. Okay. 
that's called reviewers. So that, that's a, that would definitely be a good one for you to to come to to get a sense of what that's about. I don't know if you've watched any of the other. Uh, that was one of the workshops that we recorded, and it's on HSC's website. Um, but yeah, it's good good that you're diving in and getting all this information now while there's still still time. Yeah, I'm grateful for the extension. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we can sign up for one-on-ones is what you're saying. Yeah, to get more. And again, it might be a good idea to get a little bit farther in your mm -hmm. proposal so that you can come with, okay, here are the really specific questions that you could use some help thinking through. Um, but you can go ahead and sign up for a slot now. Just basically pick a date and time that works for you and plug in your name and information. Great. I see that right there. So thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Do you feel they questions. got their questions answered that they came with? I'm sure other people will appreciate your asking these. So. And so don't, please don't feel alone. Oh, Chris, go ahead. Oh, just one more quick question that I think the answer is kind of obvious, but we weren't able to get the kind of outcomes or the kind of data during COVID, during the, when our volunteers weren't able to volunteer. So can we cite data like pre-COVID data and just call it out that way? And then, you know, address how we want our outcomes to go back to where they were by recruiting and training and all of that. That makes sense to, I think, again, you won't be alone in having an interruption in both service and data collection and outcomes tracking during COVID. But just as long as you're clear about what happened and why you wanna do X, Y, or Z in this way or get back to X, Y, or Z, I, you know, that seems reasonable to, but just, just make sure that those things are clear, um, that what you're doing, again, make, make no assumptions about what people know <laughs> or understand about your particular model of delivering services or, or whatever you're doing. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from those of you who are still with us? We're about to outnumber you. <laughs> well, thanks for joining today. We may see some of you at individual TA sessions um, in the next few weeks. Good luck with your process here and hang in there. And thank you, Stella, for interpreting. Bye-bye.